Astra continues with phase C of our rocket, which will take us to the Carmen line. It looks like third time might not be the charm for the USC RPL team. And Dare continues with their liquid rocket development under Project Sparrow. This is your amateur rocketry news for the month of February. Starting off with some exciting news, Astra has finally confirmed the name of our rocket. If you've been following the channel for some time, you may already know the name for our rocket as we've been putting it into our video titles and dropping it every once in a while. But now it's officially confirmed, the name of our rocket is Transcendence! <laughs> Designing a rocket which can get to the Carmen line, especially for a student group, is quite a challenging prospect. We hope that the mission and the name of our vehicle will inspire our community to think about the boundaries in, in their lives that seem to be these impossible milestones and maybe a reminder to us that you can transcend these boundaries. We're going to keep fighting for our goal, so we hope that you also will fight for yours. So what's going on under the hood of Transcendence? Well, we've basically designed a hybrid rocket system which is going to utilize nitrous oxide and paraffin wax in order to power our vehicle to the Carmen line. This is a pretty common fuel combination for vehicles that are attempting to go this far and we're confident that this is the right choice for the uh, safety requirements and the uh, specific impulse requirements that we have for our vehicle. Being a hybrid rocket, the propellants of, are of course stored in two different states. The nitrous oxide is stored in a liquid state in the oxidizer tank and the paraffin wax is stored in a solid state in the combustion chamber. And basically the nitrous oxide is going to flow into the combustion chamber uh, where there will be combustion happening and that's where we're going to produce our thrust. In order to accommodate all the structure we've designed an innovative system where we're going to use carbon fiber tubes and enclose them with aluminum bulkheads. This is a relatively simple approach to tank manufacture and we're going to be testing this design in the coming months. Transcendence will also incorporate a graphite nozzle. The reason for this is that the temperatures of the exhaust get really really high in excess of 3000 degrees Kelvin. So any sort of metal material would quickly become molten under these conditions. Graphite is able to sustain much higher temperatures because of the ablation process. Basically, as it gets really, really hot, it'll just simply evaporate and it'll carry away the heat from the walls of the, of the nozzle. Finally, at the top of the rocket, we have our avionics bay and our recovery system. And these systems are basically going to be focused on recording data for the entire flight and then recovering that data to the ground. We don't plan to recover the entire vehicle, we're just going to recover the upper bit of the vehicle with the nose cone and the avionics bay inside. The reason for this is to simplify the vehicle as much as possible and make sure that we attain our primary goal, which is to get to the carbon line. Here are some quick stats about our vehicle. It's going to be about 6.5 meters tall, and to put that in context, that's about three times the height of me. However, that pales in comparison to the height of what an orbital class rocket would look like. Uh, here's the Astra Transcendence vehicle in comparison to the Falcon 9. The maximum thrust that Transcendence is expecting to produce is about 24 kilonewtons. To put that in perspective, that's about half the thrust of a Pratt & Whitney engine that goes onto the Boeing 737. So that means if we just had four Transcendence vehicles, we could fly a Boeing 737 aircraft. Well, at least we could fly it for about 15 seconds, because that's the length of our burn. Right now, Astra is just finishing up with the preliminary design review that we're doing at DLR, which is the German Aerospace Agency. This is a really important part of vehicle design because it's our opportunity to get feedback from experts in the field. In the meantime, we've just gotten started with securing a space where we can start integrating our vehicle and beginning to procure some parts. So updates on our testing progress are soon to follow. Next up, we fly over to the American rocketry community with USC Rocket Propulsion Lab. They're hard at work with their Dome Piercer rocket, which is planned to break their own record of 103 kilometers in altitude. For the last year, they've been designing and testing their propellant grain and their combustion chamber through a series of tests with the code name uh, Earth Shaky. This past month, they went through the third iteration of this test. Now, the first two tests have not been so successful, with them both exploding within fractions of a second after ignition. And unfortunately, it looks like this third test also experienced the same problem. Well, maybe not the same problem in terms of technical reasons, but it, from an outside perspective, it basically exploded the, basically the same way. So why are all these tests failing? Well, let's take a look at what they have to say and some of the video footage that's available. The first test stand, which USC built about a year ago called Earth Shaky, failed for an interesting reason. Upon ignition of the test stand, we had some gas leakage that was seen uh, on the forward bulkhead. Basically what this means is that the seal that was locking in the combustion gases in the combustion chamber 
was failing and some of the gases were leaking out of the forward bulkhead and this is spells a really bad situation because essentially that means that, that those gases are going to corrode and destroy the bulkhead and then you'll get an explosion which is exactly what happened in this case so the usc rpl team fixed that problem and then went back to the test stand back in november with the earth shakier test stand and this one failed actually for a little bit of a different reason so the usc rpl team is using a carbon composite combustion chamber so what does this mean basically the material what that is made out of is these fibers that are wrapped around a tube and those fibers are rigidified by a resin so because we're using fibers to create the structure of the vehicle they have really good strength in the parallel to the fiber orientation but not much strength in the lateral direction so you kind of have to design your the way you wrap that tank really really well so that you balance out the forces that you're experiencing on the combustion chamber and essentially that's what happened here so the reason that rocket repulsion lab gave for their failure was that they think that there was an excess of axial strain that was on the combustion chamber and that was not really in their calculations when they designed the wrapping pattern for the combustion chamber so upon startup they had this imbalance of strain in the in the lateral direction rather than the radial direction and that caused the vehicle to kind of get longer and squeeze in and that basically put a bunch of extra strain on the fibers that essentially caused there to be a failure in the combustion chamber looking at the video that we see for the earth shakiest test stand which was a test stand that was built in february just this past february i kind of suspect that the same failure probably happened because the vehicle fails in very very similar ways with the failure happening right at the ignition of the rocket and basically you see the whole casing basically explode out. You also notice that there's a big fire that kind of happens after the combustion chamber walls have been exploded away. And what that tells me is that all the fuel stayed at the, at the test stand, basically. So this tells me that basically the combustion chamber walls failed, but there was no, ex there was no explosive propulsive power to blow all the fuel everywhere. This basically seems to indicate that the combustion chamber didn't fail because the pressures were too high inside the combustion chamber, but instead they're probably failing because there's some sort of imbalance in the strains and the tensions that are in the fiber structure itself. This is one of the challenges with designing carbon fiber tanks is that you have to always think about all of these edge cases where you could be getting strains and stresses in different directions throughout the course of the whatever the um, environment is that the tank will be performing in. And if that, those environments are changing rapidly, which in a rocket engine they are, the stresses that are on the vehicle and the radial and the axial directions are constantly changing throughout the entire burn. You kind of have to design your piece to be kind of working in all those situations. And it's actually really interesting for us at Astra because we kind of have a similar problem with our tank. It also has to, uh, our combustion chamber is also made out of carbon fiber and we're going to have kind of a similar design in terms of the the uh, radius of our of our combustion chamber and the material that we're using ours is not quite as long so maybe they, the problem won't be as severe but we certainly need to think about it it's good to see some of the lessons learned that other groups have and be able to incorporate those ideas and make sure we're designing for those situations ourselves lastly let's talk about sparrow this is actually a really interesting project that the delft aerospace rocket engineers are working on where they want to build a liquid rocket. And the reason that they're trying to build a liquid rocket engine is that they want to, ultimately in the future, they want to become the first student group that sends a rocket to orbit. Now, this is a lot different than just getting into space because this is a much, much higher challenge. And very few people in the world ever have achieved it. Like there's only a couple of countries and a couple of companies, certainly no student groups. And why is this important? So basically, if you want to go to orbit, you have to have, number one, the right efficiency. So usually liquid rockets are more efficient, so they offer the possibility that you can get into orbit. And secondly, uh, the more important part is control. So in order to go into orbit, you have to obviously um, be controlling your rocket in the higher upper atmosphere and in space. The standard design for amateurs is to just put some fins on the rocket and then, ah, it's all controlled. <laughs> you know, you'll fly true and you'll fly straight if you design your fins properly. But obviously that's not gonna work if you're flying in space because in space there's no air. So what DARE is trying to do is 
uh, at least one of their biggest challenges right now, is to design a thrust vector control system for that liquid rocket. And that's exactly what they've been working on for the last couple of months, is testing and designing this thrust vector control system. So yeah, we're definitely excited to see where this project goes and what the future implications of it might be. We could see some really interesting rocket projects coming out of the, the, their program in the future. Be sure to stay tuned with us for future rocketry updates in the amateur community. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give us a like. And remember to keep expanding your horizons.